Now, I'd like to start out today's message with a question. How many of you can say with 100% certainty, when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory, you will be one of them that raise up? That's right. Now, I noticed that there were a small number of you who enthusiastically raised your hand and said, yes, I will be there. And there were others that gave about half a smile and others that kind of wished I didn't look at them. How do we know if we're saved? Now, one of the things that you know, that I do, as you guys know, is when someone's in the hospital, I go to visit, to spend time with them, to pray with them. And one thing that I've noticed is that there is a very distinct difference in people that are on their deathbed. You have the ones that know that when Jesus comes, that they will be resurrected, that they will see life again, and they're ready. And whenever the Lord come, or whenever the Lord takes them, it is fine. And then you have others who are rather restless. They stir, and they're worried. You know, often they'll say things like, "Can you just pray that I have assurance that I know what's going to happen?" And sometimes they may even fall back on the fact that they could even be saved and say just that it won't be that bad. There was a survey done at an academy about 10 years ago, and unfortunately what their findings are is is pretty much just the same today. There were five questions that were being asked that I'd like to share with you now. Those five questions, and I'd like you to think how you would answer that as I read them to you. The first question, how would you define what a Christian is? Everybody kind of got something in their mind? The next, what do I have to do to go to heaven? The third question, would you like, you know, and and again, this is academy age people. Now, when you have kids at some point in time in your life, would you want them to have a spiritual experience similar to your own? The fourth question. If you died today, would you be resurrected with the righteous? Explain your answer. And the last question. Do you have personal time daily with the Lord? Now, as you contemplate these questions, and and I hope that, you know, as I was reading them, you kind of thought to yourself, how would I answer these questions? I'd like to share with you the results. You see, this survey was not just a one-time survey. It was actually done by a Bible teacher in one of our academies, and he did it every year for 10 years. And what he would do is he even would tell the students, I don't want you to write your name on this paper at all. Because we all know that if we put our name by something, sometimes what we put is influenced by the fact that somebody will know that I said something. So he wanted them to be completely honest. So he said, do not put your name on it. And please, just explain what your answers would be. So again, let's take a look at that first question. How would you define a Christian? Anybody want to throw a few answers out? A follower of Christ. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. As we take a look at the answers that came in, the number one answer, in fact, over 90% of the people responded over the 10-year period. The answer that they gave was always having something to do with someone who does what is right and stays out of trouble. 
Does that make sense, everybody? Number two, what do I have to do to go to heaven? And again, over 90% of the people said that you just have to be a good person. So if you are good enough, then you can be saved. The third answer, someday when you have children of your own, would you want them to have a spiritual experience the same as your own? This one was right around that 90% again. No, they don't. The next answer. If you died today, would you be resurrected with the righteous? Explain your answer. Again, 90% of the students replied over a 10-year period that they would be lost because they did not do a good enough job at being good. And then the last question. Do you have any daily time with the Lord? And again, a significant majority of them said no. They said no. Have you noticed something about all of these answers? Almost every single answer responded by their works, by their actions, by about being good. You follow what I'm saying? So if your view of being a Christian is based off of your actions, how long does it take before you get discouraged and say, I give up? I can't do this. I'm trying to live to a standard that I'm not able to meet. In fact, there's been a number of research that has been done just in the last couple of years. Pastor Adam Case, our our new ministerial director, shared with many of us pastors, well, all of us pastors, in an email that he had sent out that, and and again, if my recollection is correct, he said something like 40% of the people who have left the church do not have any issue whatsoever with what we believe doctrinally. They love the message. But the reason why they had chosen to leave is because they can't live up to the lifestyle because they feel they just can't do it. I don't know about you, but that makes me sad. And for those of you who relate to these opinions, I hope that you pay attention to the rest of what I'm about to say. You see, the devil, I believe, wants us to focus on our actions. And he wants us to focus on what everybody else is doing. Because as long as we're looking horizontal, we're not looking vertical at the solution. But how do we answer the question, can you be kept out of heaven for having unconfessed sin? What do you think? If we have unconfessed sin, can we go to heaven still? I see some people going, there's others going, there's others just not quite sure what to do with the question. They're pondering it back and forth. Because really we have quite a dichotomy here, don't we? Because doesn't the scriptures tell us that in order to be saved that we have to repent? Do they not? And if we don't repent, then can we be saved? Then I have to ask the question again. Can we be saved if there is an unconfessed sin? I notice that I'm getting a lot of mixed responses. I notice that. Let's take a look at what the Bible teaches. I think in order for us to deal with this, I think we need to look at what sin really is. So one of the verses that is often given is that sin is a transgression of the law, right? 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. 
Isn't that what it says? You know, if we go specifically at it, it says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Right? So if we sin, we are automatically breaking the law according to that text. Is that fair? So what is sin? Lawlessness. But I've got a question for you. Is it really about the law or is it about behavior? Either one? Neither one? Okay. Let me take... A fast poll, and I, and I do want you to respond to this one, and I will respond as well. You're driving down the road. You're in a 55-mile-an-hour zone, and you're pretty sure you're doing a bit faster than that. Maybe even you're not. But then you see a police officer. What do you do? How many of us just keep going and don't even do anything different? How many of us, the first thing we do is, okay. (laughs) Am I the only one that looks at the speedometer when I see a policeman on the side of the road? Of course not. We all do that. Why? Why do we do that? We might be speeding. We might get stopped. We don't want to meet the welcoming committee. We don't like the ticket and that nice little piece of paper that says he wants us to pay money for breaking the law. As we look at this example, is our problem the law itself? Is it the behavior? Or is the behavior a byproduct of breaking the law? either because if we weren't breaking the law would we have anything to worry about would there be any reason for us to even look down to our speedometer what do you think so is it possible that this is a problem with the law or is it a problem with our behavior But now let's think about how the law is summarized. You know, as we think about the text, specifically Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 37, we've got the scribes and the Pharisees coming. And in fact, one of the lawyers even comes to Jesus himself and he says, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And what does Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, And with all of your soul. This is the first and the greatest of the laws, right? But the second is just like it. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. So as we consider this text, what are we able to glean? But before we answer that question, I want you to think about how Paul deals with the law. Let's take a look in the book of Romans, chapter 13, verse 10. If you'll join me there. Romans, chapter 13, verse 10. Romans, chapter 13, verse 10. Law does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So, as we consider what Paul said, isn't Paul actually saying the same thing as what Jesus said? A fulfillment of the law is to love God and to love man. Right? So so they're speaking the same language here aren't we? And what is the law? You know, we say over and over again, the Ten Commandments are a transcription of God's character. So what does this mean? Now I'm excited that we had the young people here today 
worshiping with us because that means that I know that there's at least one teacher here. And in fact, I know that there's more than one teacher here just as I look around. In fact, we even have a principal here and the building principal here from our school in Milwaukee. Now, the reason why I say that is because as a young person, I loved math. That was one of the areas that I really did well in. And I just want to make sure that I haven't forgot something here. If you have, let's call it A, and it is the same as something else, and let's call it B, and then you have a third thing, which is called C, and C is equal to B, then wouldn't A be equal to C? Okay. I see some people nodding their heads. So if A equals B, B equals C, A equals C, it's the same thing. So let's take a look at what the text just said. If we take a look at, okay, we have the law, and the law is defined by love, which is defined by who God is, then wouldn't the law not only equal love but God? Okay, I'm either not making any sense or you're looking at me like, what are you talking about here? Does this make sense? Because as, again, we take a look at it, it says in Matthew 22, starting in verse 37, going through 40, you know that the two greatest commandments is to love the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul. The second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul tells us that... Love is the fulfillment of the law. So we see that each of these three things are equal. So if the law equals love and love equals God, then God equals the law. The law is a transcript of God's character, as we just talked about. Therefore, breaking the law or lawlessness is the same as separating from God. Does this make sense, my friends? So as we take a look at this, is the issue really with sin the fact that I do something, or is the issue with sin the lack of the relationship with my Savior? Isn't that really the heart of the problem? Because as we're struggling with things, and if we're looking only at the behavior How can we ever be confident? How can we ever have peace? But if we recognize that there is a war going on around us, that great controversy between God and Satan, and Satan is doing everything he can to make us fall, and yet God is trying to pick us up, and then we're able to see the bigger picture. We're able to see that relationship. Who are we going to have a relationship with? So, if we take a look at sin as a behavior, behavioral level instead of a relational level, that is the real issue, the real misunderstanding. So let's go back to the scriptures that brought us to this point. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. And the thing is, we need to look at everything in context. And one of the things that I love so very much about the book of 1 John is this is a relational book. The whole thing is about relationships the relationship within the Godhead, the relationship from God to man and how it all comes together. Again, let's take a look. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So as we take a look, what comes right before that? As we take a look, you know, just a couple verses earlier in chapter 2, verse 25, and this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. 
You know, it goes even earlier. He's talking about our relationship with Christ. And in order to have life, we have to have that friendship, that relationship with him. The devil wants us to have that wrong focus. He tries to shift our attention because as long as we're focused on all of the areas in which we fall short, then we can't ever win. If we look at each other and how we present ourselves to the world, boy, you got it all figured out. And I've got my struggles. You must be a better person than I am, a better Christian. But actually, you have your problems too, don't you? The devil wants us to keep looking at each other and comparing each other. Or maybe we, maybe I can even look at myself and say, well, you know what, at least I don't sin as bad as that guy. And we justify our actions and say, well, it's actually not that bad. Or it's actually not my fault. If, if this other person wouldn't have done this, then I wouldn't need to do that. But isn't that a straw man argument? Isn't that a false argument? You know, the devil likes to use fear. Another verse that many of us have seen over and over and over again, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is... But the gift of God is eternal life. As long as we are so focused on the action, we miss out on the blessing. And in fact, this is something that preachers have used throughout the years. You may think back to the, the second great reformation that was going on you know, around the same time as the early Advent movement, the Millerite movement that actually started to fuel people to come into that. There is a famous preacher by the name of Jonathan Edwards, and what he would do is he'd preach powerful, powerful sermons that were designed to keep you in fear until you come back next week. And then we're going to give it to you again to keep your behavior in line until the next week. One of his sermons, you may remember, is called Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. And his sermon was premised off the ideal that hell is burning forever and Jesus is just waiting. He's got all of us right by our ankles and he's just waiting for us to screw up enough that he lets go. That he drops us in to the flames to burn. Now, if that's the message you're hearing, What's your natural response going to be? To run the other way. And that's what usually ends up happening. Because fear can only be a motivator for so long before you just say, I just can't do it. It doesn't even matter. You guys may have heard Stories like this example that I'm about to share. One time there was a group of young people that had gone out skiing on a nice vacation. And there was a group that went skiing on the Sabbath. Now, it was deemed at least by this one group of people that if it was cross-country skiing, then it was okay. But if it was downhill skiing, that would be enjoying it a bit too much. Therefore, it's wrong. And he was skiing downhill on the Sabbath. And this poor little guy ended up falling and busted his leg. The conversation at the church the next week was, Oh, did he hear about little Johnny? Little Johnny broke his leg. You know, it's just too bad he was skiing on the Sabbath. Haven't we heard stuff like that? Maybe haven't we even said stuff like that? You know, God is just angry at me because I'm not good enough. Acts chapter 17, verse 28 reads, For in him we live and move and have our being. 
as also some of you, some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So let me get this straight. In him, in who? In God, in Jesus, we live and we move and we have our being because we are his offspring. So what are we able to glean from that? I mean, isn't this another relational text? Now, did it say anything that I have to be perfect in order to be God, to be God's? It didn't. But it did say that God is the source of life, doesn't it? As we take a look again, just at that last part of that verse, it says, for we are also his offspring. Now, I've got a question for you. Many of you are parents. And along with little kids, comes crying in the middle of the night, comes wet and dirty diapers, comes all sorts of messes at the, ta- at the kitchen table. Have any one of you ever said, now kid, you're out of here. When you can stay dry through the night, come on back. But until then, would we ever do that? Why not? Because we love our kids. If we are able to love our kids to the point that we are going to help them even in those dirty years, don't you think that God is going to love us and help us even in those dirty years? You know, as we think about it, maybe God has adult size diapers and wipes to clean us up from when we screw up. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 19. Bad things come when you abandon the Lord. Your own wickedness will correct you and your backslidings will rebuke you. Know, therefore, and see that it is an evil and bitter thing, that you have forsaken the Lord your God, and the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord of hosts. So how is it that bad things come? Is it because of our actions or is it because we walked away from God? In life, we can cut the cord from God, can't we? And things separate. I've got a question for you. If we had a lamp up here, and I plugged it in to the power outlet down here. Would it work? Yeah, the switch is on, the light bulb's going, and it shines away. Now, if I were to unplug that cord, what's going to happen to the light? It goes out. Is it because the church is now punishing that light? It's because that connection was lost. That's the way it is for us. If we lose our connection with the life source, if we lose the connection of power, then bad things happen as a response to it. You know, but some say, well, what about faith? Let's take a look in Romans chapter 14, verse 23. Romans 14, 23. It says, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. And we've got the, you know, the, the textbook definition in Hebrews chapter 11. But doesn't it, faith ultimately boil down to trust? So how do we build our faith? Well, according to the world, according to secular humanism, it's about positive thinking. I think I can. I think I can. It's kind of like that little engine that could. If I just focus long enough and hard enough and I try enough, then I can do anything. 
I'm just going to keep a positive attitude. I'm going to think good thoughts. And I'm going to trust in myself to be able to do it. But how do we really build faith? I've got a question for you. Is Jesus trustworthy? Can you say that definitively without any doubt? Good. Now, if I were to to turn around and my friend Walter was to come up behind me, and if I was to go like this and have my hand, my legs together like this, and if I fell back, would I believe that he's going to catch me? Why would I believe that? Because I like Walter. He's a friend of mine, and I don't think he'd ever let me fall down and get hurt. Right? See, he's amening that, we have, that we're friends. But the question is, is, do we trust Jesus enough to lay back on him when those times get tough? And when we don't, is it because he's not a good guy? He's not able to do it? Or is it just that we don't know him enough? We don't trust him enough. We don't have faith enough that he's actually going to take care of us. It goes into relationship. Just a couple more thoughts and then we're going to wrap this up. In John chapter 6, verses 6, it says, Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor know him. So does that mean that I have to be perfect? Does that mean I can never screw up and make a mistake? It means in order to be saved, I have to have a forever friendship relationship with Jesus. Do you have that relationship? Do you want to further that relationship? John, 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. Can we stand on that promise, by the way? It says that God has given us eternal life, and life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Can we be confident that we have salvation? And how is that? Is it because, well, we know that there is this guy named Jesus and we believe that he is the Son of God or is it because I am friends with him, because I walk with him, because I spend time with him, that I know he is my friend because I can hear his voice when he talks to me in my prayers, in scripture, in music, through other people? How many of you would say that you're good friends with someone that you've never talked to? Probably not. But if we have that friendship, we can be confident. We can know without a doubt that we have eternal life. There was a guy who loved Corvettes. And he met this young lady who had a really nice Corvette. And he thought she wasn't half bad either. But for the sake of the story, they end up dating and getting to know each other and they get married. When it came time to the renew of the plates, you know, she had put his name in on the title. Now, does he own the Corvette? Does he have the Corvette? He does, right? Because, you know, in marriage, everything becomes what's yours is mine and mine is yours. 
And, and when she put his name on the title, that meant that that Corvette was his. But now let's just say for the sake of saying they got divorced. And here in Wisconsin, what starts out is, you know, what's yours is yours and what's hers is, is theirs. And as long as you're not putting money in or going out, you know, that stuff is separate and then the rest of the assets are divided equally. At least that's the way it's supposed to work here in the state of Wisconsin. So now that Corvette goes back to her. Does he now have access to the Corvette anymore? Why not? Because that relationship has been broken. Closing thoughts. Romans chapter 8, verses 15 and 16. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We don't kick each other out because somebody made a mistake. As a family, aren't we supposed to come together? Aren't we supposed to rally around each other to tell them that we love them, that even though they screwed up, that we still love them and we still want them to be part of our family? How much more would God do that with us? He came from heaven to walk in our shoes, to experience what we experience, to be tempted in every way. And he paid the price for us. If a loving God, a God that would do that for us, do you think that he would arbitrarily look for a reason to cast you out? So my friends, the Bible tells us, Philippians chapter 1 verse 5, that God is going to finish the good work that he has started in us. So as long as we continue to walk with him, doesn't that mean that he's going to finish it, that he's going to fix it? And what happens at the end of the day? We get to go home. We get to go home. So my question to you again, my friends, is going back to that survey. What does it mean to be a Christian? Can we be confident that we have eternal life? I think the answer to those questions are really pretty simple. If we walk with Jesus, if we have a friendship with him, we can be confident without a doubt that when he comes in the clouds of glory, we will be called up along with him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we'd like to thank you that you love us so very much. We'd like to thank you that the scriptures are clear, that sin is not about the actions. The actions are just the byproduct of a relationship with you or a lack of relationship with you. Please, Lord, continue to draw us close to you. Continue to help us to walk with you each and every day. Help us that we will have the relationship that you are our best friend. Lord, we want to thank you that you hear our prayers. We want to thank you that you have been working in our lives and you're continuing to make us perfectly in your image. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.